Unfortunately, the ISS, or International Space Station, is coming to the end of its life, and it's not going to be saved. It's going to be brought back down to Earth and somewhere in the ocean. But unlike some other characters in the space industry, we want to do this in a precise and controlled manner, and NASA is using SpaceX to help them achieve this. Here's one of the first renderings we're seeing of the US deorbit vehicle with six times more propellant and four times the power power of today's Dragon spacecraft. The International Space Station has been a global collaboration for the good of humanity for over 25 years. And for me personally, it's been the high point of my career to be able to support its operations in so many different ways. Most college students today have never known a day when it was not orbiting overhead every 90 minutes. There have been many calls to save the ISS as it reaches near the end of its life. But despite some people wanting it to be preserved, unfortunately, it will be brought down back to Earth and in a controlled manner. So who you gonna call? Not Ghostbusters, a SpaceX. With the ISS's life coming to a close, NASA has chosen to deorbit it safely with SpaceX's help developing an entirely new US deorbit vehicle. NASA gave a media briefing recently to talk more about their plans and a SpaceX representative also chimed in. So one of the benefits of leveraging Dragon's rich flight history is that we can continue to use NASA certified hardware for a number of the key systems like the docking system and propulsion system components like our Draco engines that were developed for our Dragon crew and cargo missions to the International Space Station and that we have a, a long history of flying together with NASA. So while the assembly level design is uniquely developed for this mission, we intentionally use building blocks of components that NASA is familiar with and, and that SpaceX has extensive experience building and operating. When I look at uh, um, all the programs that ended in the past, um, I can see that something came after them, that something new and exciting came after every program that we've had previously. And I, I think we're going to see the same thing with ISS as we transition to the commercial LEO destinations in the future. Um, and so it's exciting to me to talk about this, this deorbit vehicle. Think of it this way. While many of you may have been sad when Space Shuttle retired, it birthed a whole new exciting way to ferry astronauts to and from the space station. Commercially, of course, with the SpaceX Dragon launching crew for the first time on May 30th, 2020 as the SpaceX Demo 2 mission. And I vividly remember watching this. So while the ISS is coming to an end, we can get excited about the new possibilities of what will replace it. But also planning its end of life is going to take a couple years of preparation. The International Space Station continues to be a very busy place with dynamic activity about once a week. So in order to get the most life out of the ISS, the crew will continue to work there until about six months before its end of life. We do plan to continue fully operating the station through the end of its life. When we reach that eventual end of life, we will deorbit the space station through a controlled re-entry and we will put it in some uninhabited part of the ocean. We haven't pick the exact uh, location yet, but it will be in some very large uninhabited region. And cue the fish saying, damn it, we can't catch a break. Or maybe the sharks. The deorbit is the responsibility of the entire ISS partnership. Last fall, NASA requested proposals from the industry to develop this deorbit vehicle, and it could take several years, which is why it's good to get a head start. One thing to keep in mind is with any new vehicle development, it can be pretty complex and sometimes it can take a bit longer than what you expect. Historically, vehicles of this level of complexity could take five to eight years to develop. And so we thought it was really important that we start now. And this contract is a little different. The vehicle itself is being delivered to NASA, and then NASA has the responsibility to go and procure a launch vehicle and also to operate it. Apparently, they'll do the launch vehicle procurement in the future, but... I mean, why wouldn't they use SpaceX? Also, the USDV or USD orbit vehicle has to work, which is why it's good they chose SpaceX, who already has such extensive experience with Dragon. Obviously, it's got to continue to perform critical burns, even if it encounters anomalies. So we require high reliability and a two-fault tolerant approach to the vehicle design. So in the RFP, one of the things we ask for is maximizing the use of heritage flight proven hardware so we could increase the reliability. Of course, there is no existing vehicle that meets the high propulsive needs of the USDV, 
but we certainly can leverage hardware and systems that have been flown and tested in space already. The SpaceX concept leverages the Dragon vehicle, but about half the vehicle will be new design. So the concept of operations for the deorbit vehicle is incredibly complex, as Dana described. It requires substantial development to build a vehicle capable of such a mission. So it will ultimately take driving control of the International Space Station, so to speak, and propel the entire station into a precise deorbit trajectory that terminates in an unpopulated ocean area so that any elements that could survive atmospheric reentry pose no risk to the public. So to achieve this, the deorbit vehicle will need six times the usable propellant and three to four times the power generation and storage of today's Dragon spacecraft just for scale. It needs enough fuel on board not just to complete the primary mission, but also to operate on orbit in partnership with the space station for about 18 months. Then at the right time, it'll perform a complex series of actions, and Dana describes some of those um, burns and, and steps over several days to your to deorbit the International Space Station. The thing that I think is is most complex um, and challenging is that, that this burn must be powerful enough to fly the entire space station, all the while resisting the torques and forces caused by increasing atmospheric drag on the space station to ensure that it ultimately terminates in the intended location. So the vehicle design will build upon SpaceX's operational Dragon cargo spacecraft with an enhanced trunk section that will host propellant tanks, engines, avionics, power generation, and thermal hardware tailored to complete this mission. So almost a spacecraft in and of itself attached there as, as a, a new trunk. A representative says ideally we'd have the USD orbit vehicle delivered well in advance of the station's end to life. The contract also contains what's called a dwell in storage requirement. So this allows for SpaceX and NASA to deliver the vehicle early and then just store it and do periodic maintenance until they're ready to launch it. We've been working in low Earth orbit for over 60 years, and we've learned a lot through all the time and work in LEO. Turns out microgravity is cost effective as a place to work. NASA is transitioning to commercially owned space destinations. So the end of its operational life is in 2030. Unfortunately for all the people who were hoping the station could be moved to a medium high orbit, sealed and declared a universal heritage site, it looks like that's not gonna happen. Someone with the media asked a question, is anything of the ISS going to be saved? Ken, you spent many, many months up on uh, the space station. Uh, this must be a little bittersweet for you. And was there any thought given to how you might preserve some of the history up there uh, or will it all just end up in the ocean? Well, we're, uh, thanks, yeah. I, my time on ISS was wonderful <laughs> and I'd, I'd love to go back uh, I'm glad it's going to be fly flying for a while longer so we can all watch it and, and, uh, and think about some of the things that you brought up, right? It's not too late for us to bring some pieces home. Uh, unfortunately, we can't bring home really, really big stuff, but, I, but I'm sure there's some mementos that we'll get back and uh, that will end up in museums someday. Um, we'd like to be able to be, be, bring uh, big pieces home, but the station really wasn't designed to be taken apart. It was designed to be put together and um, it would be re relatively expensive to tie and try and bring something really large home. Um, but uh, I, I would love, my, the emotional part of me would love to try and uh, save some of ISS but the practical part of me realizes that uh, using something like the USDV and bringing it uh, safely uh, back into the ocean somewhere um, is, is the most practical approach. So I'm curious what you think in the comments. Do you wish that we could save and preserve the ISS? Or do you think that it's okay to bring it back down to earth and in the ocean? Either way, I'm glad that SpaceX was chosen for this contract. It's clear they have a lot of experience in this area. And so no, as I am a little bit biased for SpaceX, they have been testing and operating Dragon for over 17 years. SpaceX is, a proud, is proud to be a partner of all that the space station has contributed to the world already and all it will continue to contribute in its active operations phase for many years to come. I mean, NASA was one of SpaceX's first partners. They selected SpaceX to help support an ongoing presence aboard the space station with cargo resupply services back in 2006. Then in May 2012, Dragon became the first commercial vehicle to visit the space station. And in those 12 years, SpaceX has had 43 Dragon missions to the ISS that have helped ensure the continued operation of the station, delivering critical supplies, scientific research, new modules, solar arrays, 
and 12 crews to the orbiting laboratory. So is SpaceX a good pick? Absolutely. If you guys enjoyed this video and all of my Starship coverage, please subscribe to Ellie in Space. It's completely free and that way you won't miss any future videos. If you want to take it a step further, please consider signing up for my Patreon. YouTube revenue can be very unpredictable and hit or miss. And you guys on my Patreon are why I'm able to take these trips and help me experience the life that I'm very thankful to live down here at Starbase and many of the other places that I've gone to report for the channel and the places that I'll be going in the future.